In the suburbs of Salt Lake City, not everything is what it seems. Jeremy Nelson is a homeowner, a husband, and a proud father. He was once also devoted to straight edge before he made a break from the movement. I was straight edge for, you know, the majority of my childhood. I wasn't going to be like my father. And he did things like drinking and drugs and smoking and all those things. And I decided early on that I didn't want to do any of those. Jeremy got into bands and immersed himself in every aspect of straight edge. Now a family man, he sells what's left over of those days on eBay and regrets how it all changed. I wanted to get away from it when I started to see it become gang related. Some people just walk away from Straight Edge, but Jeremy Nelson did something more radical. I pull the fruit fast, keep me from getting shot. He became a cop. Jeremy's inside knowledge gets put to use every day, tracking gang activity. Recently, he stumbled on this abandoned factory where he found a version of a turf war. Graffiti that showed straight edge in a verbal battle with other gangs. You can see where some of the other gangs have tagged over it. They said drug free. The other gangs will come in and say, you are fags. You can see the insane clown posse stuff. Weed is good. And this is kind of what fuels a lot of those battles between those two. Graffiti is how gangs claim territory and even send specific threats. And that is precisely the problem now. Whether or not a portion of straight edge kids think of themselves as gang members, if other gangs see them that way, they become drawn into the gang world. In the US, more than 700,000 youth are part of street gangs. And though Salt Lake City may seem an unlikely center for gangs, they've staked their claim here. Now, Straight Edge is one of them. When we were investigating other gangs and other crimes and stuff like that, the word Straight Edge would come up occasionally. We were wondering, well, who is this group or what are they doing or what is a Straight Edger? And they're saying, hey, look, we don't do drugs. We don't do alcohol. We don't do tobacco. We don't have premarital sex, but there was just something that didn't stick right in my mind that this isn't this is a typical group. Detective Brent Larson and Sergeant Stephen Waldridge investigated the violent acts that got the group in trouble. They tracked more than 40 violent incidents, including a mob attack, arson at a McDonald's, and the bombing of a mink farm. I think the biggest realization for me was probably about the time when they caught the guys was he drinking a beer at the Salt Lake State Fairgrounds and busted a bottle and then tried to carve an X in this guy's back. That's when it was just like, whoa, these guys are, are really kind of out of control. Looking back on it with 2020 vision, wow, uh, yeah, it probably was eventual that somebody was going to end up getting killed. Someone did. His name was Bernardo Repriza. He was 15 years old. Sergeant Waldridge took us to the scene of the crime, nine years to the day after it happened. It was Halloween night, a Saturday night in 1998. We had literally thousands of people out cruising around. A group of 30 to 40 straight edge gang members and their associates were hanging out here in the street corner. Straight edge kids were yelling taunts at some of the passing cars including one carrying several local gang members. The car stopped. Kids got out, and a punch was thrown that set off a brawl. Soon, it was 30 straight-edge kids against seven. There was a stabbing that occurred over in that parking lot. The victim of the homicide he ran southbound across the street. He was chased down by four straight-edge gang members. He fell to the ground. He was struck several times in the head with a baseball bat, and then he was uh, struck with a spring billy and stabbed. Bernardo Repriza bled to death on the street. Two straight-edge teenagers were convicted in the killing. It was a rude awakening that 
a group not traditionally identified as a traditional street gang was involved in, in something as serious as this that really was a wake-up call. For the first time in the nation, Straight Edge became a certified gang. Yet to this day, the Salt Lake murder is the only killing definitively attributed to Straight Edge. While alcohol alone is implicated in the top three causes of death for teenagers, drunk driving, suicide, and homicide. Had everyone gone too far? I think it's unfortunate that Straight Edge has been labeled a gang in some places because it produces two outcomes. One, it attracts kids to Straight Edge who might want to be involved in gang-like behavior. And two, it gives Straight Edge a bad name for those kids who are simply trying to live out a positive lifestyle. Straight Edge was now caught squarely between its positive and militant sides. And the battle over whether it really deserves to be a gang moved to new fronts. Reed High School, Sparks, Nevada. According to its authorities, this suburban district school has become an epicenter of straight edge and the violence that now gathers around it. The halls here are like schools all across the country, but more heavily guarded. A vice principal of discipline and a contingent of full-time armed police officers patrol every day. Because we've had some shootings, we're looking at Columbine, you're looking at Virginia Tech, um, you know, where you've, you're seeing fatalities, that's a little scary. A lot of it is just being proactive and trying to be on top of everything. But what they are really concerned about is gangs. And because of dozens of incidents this year alone involving straight edge kids, they are watching the movement carefully. This year, it felt like Straight Edge was starting to emerge again. There started to be more problems. Literally, it was like a, an entire week or two of problem every single day. What will happen is they will get about 15 guys and circle around one, and then they beat up on one guy. And they usually don't just use their hands. It's usually, like I said, pepper spray, brass knuckles, and some sort of weapon. Hackbush and his officers patrol the halls looking for evidence of gangs, including Straight Edge, Sometimes clues as apparently inoffensive as a t-shirt that says drug free. It says drug free. What other message, more positive message, would you want at your school? Well, you're, you're right. Until there's about five to ten of them wearing the same exact drug free sweatshirt and wearing that, you know, and, and then that's their outfit. But such vigilance from the law can be confusing to kids who look to straight edge as a way to stay out of trouble. On a quaint suburban street in Sparks, Zeke looks like an ordinary kid. A Reed High School junior, Zeke learned about Straight Edge not long ago. And like many kids, felt like he had found a home. It was really eye-opening when I found out like on the internet and stuff that like Straight Edge is all over. At first I thought, oh, maybe it's just like, maybe it's just Reno or something. And then I found out it's all over like Boston and Salt Lake and everything. I found it, it's all over the world even. It meant a lot being part of something so, like, big. Well, he's always been a little rebel. I guess not, you know, not a bad rebel, but he always, he, he's never been a mainstream kid because he, he thinks for himself. Annette, who doesn't abstain from alcohol and tobacco, had to raise Zeke on her own after Zeke's father died. Well, he's like your typical teenager because he goes to school and he has friends and doesn't want to clean his room. And on the other side, he's not typical because he's made these choices to not drink and do drugs and, and not poison his body. Annette, as with many parents, is caught between what seems like a good choice for her kid and the reputation she hears about from Reed High School. I worry that someone would come to him and try and recruit him to a, another level. I hope that I've educated him, you know, not to fall in with the wrong 